So thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very, I feel very lucky to be here. Um, uh, so this is joint work with a bunch of people. Um, uh, the results that I'm going to be presenting uh, were joint with uh, Phil Long at Google, Gabor, uh, and Alex Sigler, who's a PhD student in statistics at Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to be giving a perspective that um, we take in a survey paper that was uh, uh, joint with Andrea Montanari and um, Sasha Rachlin. Okay, so, um, so this phenomenon of benign overfitting, what I, what I want to talk about today, um, is, is something that uh, the practitioners in deep learning have, have discovered, that these deep neural nets can be trained to uh, get zero empirical risk, even with a regression loss, um, uh, and still have near state-of-the-art performance uh, on, on um, prediction problems, even when we know that there's noise in the problem. So, you know, this is quite a striking, striking phenomenon. So, uh, these are plots from a paper that a group um, uh, working at Google at the time produced a few years ago. Uh, on the x-axis of these plots is the level of noise in, in the training sample. So they've introduced noise into, into the sample. It's, it's a particular um, uh, image classification problem. Um, uh, so, you know, as we go from, from a, uh, no noise to a, a high level of noise, um, the two plots are showing, the top one is showing uh, how long it takes for a stochastic gradient method to train a deep network uh, to get essentially zero empirical risk. Uh, and this is a, with a regression loss uh, for, you know, the different, different colors of different neural net architectures. Um, the, the lower plot is showing on the y-axis the, um, uh, an unbiased estimate of the population risk in those cases. And, you know, the striking thing here is that you're getting um, uh, the the degradation in, in accuracy as you add noise is, is really rather uh, graceful here. Um, so, you know, that's a surprising thing, that, that we know that there's noise in the problem, so they're, they're certainly overfitting here, um, but, but overfitting doesn't seem to be um, uh, so harmful uh, for predictive accuracy. Okay, so this has been, been observed in other settings in, in um, uh, regression problems also in kernel, for, for kernel methods, uh, as well as deep, deep neural nets. So we don't see this sort of classical trade-off between the fit to the training data and, and the complexity of the, of the prediction rule that we're using. Um, uh, you know, we've got, uh, I, I guess there's no trade-off possible if the fit is, is perfect. Um, so we're certainly overfitting. We know that the empirical risk that we're seeing on these networks is uh, smaller than the best we should ex expect, right? It's smaller than the, the best case population risk, um, uh, and, and yet that overfitting is benign in the sense that the predictive accuracy is, uh, uh, is, is still uh, rather good. All right, so, you know, we teach our undergraduates uh, that this is a bad idea, right? We shouldn't be fitting too well to the, to the data, and, and Sasha Ruckland pulled out these nice quotes from from some of the textbooks that, we, that, that we're all familiar with that says, you know, interpolating data is, is uh, not likely to give a reasonable estimate. Uh, so I think it's, you know, this is quite an exciting, um, exciting phenomenon. It's, it's um, you know, something that we're, we're seeing um, uh, this approach of getting a, a very small training error on, on noisy data uh, leading to, to good prediction. It's, it, it really goes against the statistical wisdom that we're all familiar with. Um, so uh, some of the, there's been a bunch of work in this, in this direction over the last few years. Uh, some of the earliest work was on um, uh, kernel smoothing methods. So Misha Belkin, Misha Belkin and, and collaborators. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about, about that uh, in a moment. Um, and then this, this uh, uh, very nice work of Teng Yuen and, and Sasha Rachlin uh, on um, kernel uh, RKHS um, uh, prediction. Um, so at, 
around the same time as the work that I'm going to be telling you about, there was uh, a bunch of activity, including um, uh, in, in linear regression, looking at um, uh, uh, particular examples, look, uh, uh, looking at some exact asymptotics in linear regression. So we're going to be talking about a characterization of um, this phenomenon in a linear regression setting. Uh, and then following this, this work, you know, there's been an enormous um, a collection of papers. I've given a kind of partial list here just to give you the idea of the scale. Um, uh, you know, including including work by people here. Um, we're going to we're going to hear Muhammad telling us about some um, uh, results about ro robustness in in these sorts of uh, benign overfitting situations uh, this this evening. So um, you know, a lot of work. Uh, I also want to mention there's this uh, survey paper, uh, and I want to tell you a bit about the perspective that we that we give in that paper. With uh, it's appeared in Acta Numerica. It's with um, Andrea Montanari and Sasha Rocklin. The the intuition that we try to convey there, um, I think, applies to all of the um, all of the cases where we know um, where, where we can pr prove this this benign overfitting property. Um, in all those cases, the prediction rule decomposes into two parts. Right, one part is something that's simple in a classical sense. You know, it has a small um, uh, statistical complexity in the, in the sort of um, uh, sense that we're used to. And, and the other part is something that is very complex. Um, uh, you know, you can think of it as a spiky component that's useful for fitting to the noise, um, but it doesn't have an impact on predictive accuracy. So it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt. Um, uh, you know, that's the, that's the kind of um, intuition to keep in your mind. Um, for, for some of the, uh, the examples that we'll look at, look at today. Okay, so um, let's start with a classical approach, um, Nutterai Watson kernel smoothing. So here we're, we're, we have a, a sample of xy pairs, x1, y1 through xn, yn, and uh, we're predicting for a, for a new x, we're predicting a, a y, let's say a real valued y, uh, by um, taking some sort of convex combination of the yi's from our sample, and for a point x, the weight that we, that we apply to the, the yi, some yi from the sample, is given by you know, this, this kernel k sub h, which tells us, um, uh, so it's evaluated at x minus xi, and it tells us somehow how relevant xi is for predicting the, the corresponding y. Um, Okay, and so this h is a bandwidth parameter, so you know, adjusting, um, adjusting sort of the, the nearness of x to, to xi. Um, okay, so this work that I mentioned um, by Misha Belkin, Sasha Rucklin, Sasha Sibukov, um, and, and Misha and other collaborators, is for a, um, uh, a singular kernel. So this is, um, uh, you know, instead of the, the kernels that we're used to, this one actually goes to infinity at zero. So you're putting all of the weight on uh, the, if, if x actually approaches this point xi, you're putting all of the weight on, on yi, right? So this is an interpolating uh, prediction method. And, and they were able to show that for, you know, classical um, uh, smoothness classes, you could get minimax rates for appropriate choice of that bandwidth parameter with these kind of crazy, crazy kernels, so compact kernels with this singularity at zero. Okay. Um, uh, you know, and, and kind of skating over that, the intuition is exactly what I described. It's, it's as if you have this simple component, which is the compact kernel, and on top of that, you've got this spiky piece that's doing the interpolating, but it has a small L2P norm, or is responsible for a small L2P norm. So you're really not impacting the predictive accuracy by doing this interpolation. Um, uh, but there's another piece that is doing all of the, all of the prediction. Okay, so um, uh, just with that, with that taste, the agenda for the rest of today's uh, lecture is looking at the linear regression problem. I'll tell you uh, about the assumptions that we make there. Um, and, then, and then at the uh, characterization of, of this phenomenon of benign overfitting in a linear regression setting uh, and uh, some extensions to ridge regression. And then I'll spend a bit of time on um, uh, future directions on open, open problems. Okay, so 
We're talking about linear regression. Um, I'm going to fix some notation. We've got um, X's and Y's. X's are from a Hilbert space. This is a, you know, can be an infinite dimensional space. Um, I'll, I'll be using matrix vector notation. Um, uh, but, you know, this is just kind of to um, uh, simplify the way I present things, uh, but, but the X's can come from an infinite dimensional space. Uh, and we have a real valued response that we'd like to predict. We're thinking of those X's and Y's being generated from some probability distribution. Uh, the, the assumptions are that we have a sub-Gaussian distribution, right? So in every direction we get, um, you know, something that's no heavier than Gaussian tails. Um, the X's and Y's are mean zero. Uh, we're in the well-specified setting, so the conditional expectation of Y given X uh, is linear. Um, uh, and, and we assume that X satisfies a small ball condition, right? So we don't have um, uh, too much probability um, uh, concentrated around, around zero. Okay, um, some notation I'm going to use here. We've got a covariance matrix sigma for our X's and the, these lambda 1 through uh, lambda 1, lambda 2 and so on are the uh, eigenvalues of that covariance matrix. So the variance in these uh, different directions, lambda 1 is in the you know, first principal component direction uh, and, and so on. So these play a crucial role in, in, in everything really. Theta star, I'd mentioned earlier, this is the, the um, parameter vector that minimizes the, the population uh, uh, risk. So the, the expected squared error between y and this linear prediction. Um, uh, and sigma squared is the corresponding uh, uh, expected squared error. Okay, so we're going uh, we're gonna to use this no notation throughout. Okay, um, the particular estimator we're going to consider is the minimum norm estimator. So we're thinking of a setting where we can fit the data perfectly. So there's a whole, you know, affine subspace of solutions uh, that, that give zero empirical risk. And, and the particular element of that, of that subspace is the minimum norm one, All right? So the notation we'll use here, we have a matrix X of, uh, uh, you know, the rows are our, um, uh, our, our sample X1 through Xn. We have a vector Y of responses. And as I say, we're, you know, I'm using matrix notation, but these Xs can be in an infinite dimensional space. Um, and our estimator is X pseudo inverse Y. I'm writing it as X transpose X pseudo inverse uh, X transpose Y. So that's the solution to this optimization problem. Um, you know, if, um, if we were in a parametric setting, that would just be a minimization problem. Um, but we're writing that minimization problem as a constraint and saying, you know, subject to that constraint, we want to min find the smallest norm uh, least squares theta. Um, so we're thinking of the case where this minimum is zero, and actually we have this, as I say, this whole affine subspace of, of uh, uh, parameter vectors beta that give us a zero zero risk solution, uh, zero empirical risk solution. And we pick the smallest norm one. Why that choice? Um, so, you know, motivated by the stochastic gradient methods that people use in, uh, in, in deep learning, we can think about a gradient flow for this least squares problem if we initialize, initialize that at zero uh, and um, uh, use, a, use a gradient flow for this, this criterion, then that converges to the minimum norm solution. Uh, in, the, in that affine subspace. Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the estimator. When we write theta hat, this is what we're, what we're talking about. Okay, and the criterion of interest here is the excess prediction error. I'm going to write it as R of theta hat. So R is the, the excess risk, the expected squared uh, error of our prediction uh, X transpose theta hat. Um, versus the best we can do, which of course is this theta star, the expected squared error of that um, uh, optimal linear prediction rule. Um, you know, we can easily uh, rewrite that as the, um, 
uh, as a quadratic form like this, right? It's the, um, uh, the difference between theta hat minus theta star measured through this covariance matrix. Uh, and so you can see the role that the, that the eigenvalues play here, right? The, those uh, lambda rise are determining the importance of the different parameter directions uh, in, in, uh, in predictive accuracy that, you know, some of the, the directions with the, with the lighter, the smaller values of lambda i are not so important. We don't have to estimate theta star very accurately in those directions. The, the heavy values of, uh, uh, of our covariance matrix, the heavy, heavy directions, the large values of lambda, uh, the, the Lambda one and lambda two and so on. They're the crucial directions, and we better get we better get theta star estimated accurately in those directions. Okay, so um, so that's the problem that we're considering, and let me tell you about the characterization. Um, before we do that, let's think about this um, minimum norm um, interpolating solution. So uh, you know, if we think about a ridge regression problem that trades off these two terms. The, the scale of the parameters and the performance on the, on the data. Uh, you know, we might write that as minimizing lambda of the norm of theta squared plus the sample average of the, of the um, squared error that this theta uh, incurs. Um, you could view that as the Lagrangian of a constrained optimization problem. Okay, so you could think of it as minimizing, well, optimizing the performance on the sample subject to a constraint on the, the scale of this parameter vector. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you could think of, the, uh, and of course the B is, it's a problem, has a problem dependent relationship to the lambda, but there is this correspondence between the two. Alternatively, we could think of the, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, motivated by the gradient flow, we consider the Euclidean norm. Um, uh, changing the norm does change, uh, you know, the nature of the solution. We're, we've got this, this whole subspace of, of um, zero empirical risk uh, solutions and, and picking uh, a different norm, you know, changes the behavior of the, of, of the estimator and, and, and its performance. So I'll say a little bit about some recent results uh, for different norms, um, uh, but you know, they're, they're kind of qualitatively quite different from, from the Euclidean case that, that I'm going to tell you about in detail. Any other questions? All right, um, yeah, and the, the third, uh, you know, rewrite of this optimization problem is viewing it as the Lagrangian of a constrained optimization where we minimize the norm subject to the constraint on the, the performance on the sample. Um, and the case we're interested in is where that constraint is in some sense unreasonable, right? We're thinking of C as zero, or later we'll be thinking of C as very close to zero, actually considering the first, first form with very small values of lambda, right? So the ridge regression problem. Um, but, but for now, you know, I guess all of the cases um, here are in this overfitting regime where, where C is way smaller than, you know, what we should, what we should be... Uh, uh, expecting, way smaller than the, the minimum of the population, um, uh, the, the expectation of the squared error. Okay, um, so yeah, so, so that's, that's the case. We're actually thinking of C equals zero, um, and our estimator is, is the minimum norm thing that, that gets things right on, on the full sample. So, you know, we are, we're totally interpolating the data. Each yi is equal to xi transpose theta hat. Uh, so any noise in the yi's is um, in, in some sense embedded in the theta hats, right? Where the question we're really asking is when can we take that, that uh, the noise in the, in the y's uh, injected into the theta hats um, in, in, in this sense and still not hurt the predictive accuracy. Um, okay, so this is um, the, the main result for this, this problem. This is combining results from um, work with uh, uh, Phil Gabor and Alex, and, and, and later work with, um, with Alex. So uh, there are universal constants. Any of these linear regression problems that I've described that, subject, that, that, that satisfy those constraints, um, we're assuming that we are in an interpolation setting, that we can interpolate the data. Um, 
And the result is in terms of a certain effective dimension. So this K star um, is uh, the dimension of a subspace where the um, uh, little r k here is the effective rank when we eliminate the, the k heaviest, the k highest variance directions. All right, so we look at the covariance in the orthogonal subspace to the k, uh, the directions where we see variance lambda 1 through lambda k. Okay, and um, uh, so we're, we're interested in uh, the smallest k for which in that orthogonal subspace we have a high effective dimension, bigger than the sample size or some constant universal constant times the sample size. All right, so that's, that's our notion of effective dimension. I'll tell you what this effective rank is in a moment, a little okay. Um, uh, with that definition of K star, we get an upper bound on the excess risk that um, involves a bias and a variance term. I'll say what, what the bias term is in a moment. The variance term here is this K star divided by N. So we better be in a low dimensional subspace. Uh, for this to be small, and then the second term is n divided by some other notion of the effective rank of that light, or low variance subspace. Okay, um, and there's a, a lower bound that shows that we can't hope to improve on this. Um, so if you give me a theta star, then um, uh, uh, with some symmetrized version where I randomly flip the signs of the components of theta star. Um, uh, and if I have a sort of suitable amount of independence, so I can write the x's, uh, so, so given a certain uh, covariance matrix sigma, if, if the distribution of x is such that I can write things in terms of this vector with independent components, right, then um, the expected excess risk is uh, essentially the same as the upper bound up to constants. Okay, and, and the bias term there, I mean, I was flipping the signs of theta stars. Uh, the bias term only depends on the magnitudes of those things um, and, and, you know, the, the covariance uh, eigenvalues. So I'll say a little bit more about this bias expression uh, later. Okay. Um, so let me tell you what these effective ranks are um, and, and, you know, what this... Uh, how we might interpret this theorem. Okay, so we've got our covariance matrix with these eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. Um, uh, the effective rank, uh, the, the little rk, the first effective rank, is after we drop the k biggest eigenvalues, look at the remaining sequence of eigenvalues, and little rk is the one norm of those divided by the infinity norm of those. Right, so it's how many times does the biggest fit into the sum of the rest. It's a notion of effective rank. And capital RK is a similar thing, but instead of the infinity norm, we've got a two norm, and we're squaring the whole thing. Right, so, um, so it's a ratio of one norm squared to the two norm squared for those, those remaining, the light, the light eigenvalues beyond the, the K heaviest. Okay, so these are two notions of effective rank. It's easy to see we always have um, uh, the little rk smaller than the big rk, um, but it's not too much smaller. There's a, you know, uh, upper bound in terms of little rk squared. Um, okay, so when we go back, well, let's, let's look at a couple of examples here. There are those definitions. Um, think about the f uh, finite rank case. Um, symmetric finite rank case, so let's say an identity matrix um, in, in dimension P. Uh, both of these notions of rank are exactly P. Right? It's just um, uh, the, these ratios of, of norms uh, uh, give us that. And we can actually rewrite these, these notions of effective rank as um, the rank of a, in, in the case of a finite rank sigma, as the rank of that, of that matrix times some measure of the symmetry of the, the eigenvalues of the matrix. And, and, you know, the appropriate measure in the little r k case is the average of the eigenvalues divided by the biggest one. And in the capital R k case, it's a, you know, one versus two norm kind of an analog. All right, and these, these numbers, these little s and capital S, 
are things that lie between zero and one, or between one over one over the rank and 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 one, um, from the most asymmetric to the most symmetric case. Okay, so you can think of these effective ranks as being, you know, also incorporating some some sort of notion of of uh, how symmetric, how close to isotropic these these uh, uh, matrices are. All right. Um, so going back to to the theorem, you know, the K star is defined in terms of that first effective rank, the the one norm divided by the infinity norm. We want that once we've dropped the K heaviest uh, highest variance directions, we want the effective rank of the covariance matrix in the orthogonal subspace to be big compared to the sample size, right? So we we want you know something that's almost isotropic in that in that orthogonal subspace, um, in uh, and and high dimensional, higher than the, than n. Uh, and when we look at the larger effective rank, capital R k, right? We want that to be uh, significantly bigger than n because we get an n over R k in our in our risk bounds, right? So you know think of what, what's going on there is we want something that looks um, uh, almost isotropic in that uh, in a uh, high dimensional subspace after we drop these k star directions. Okay, and uh, you know I called it effective dimension. If you look at the the variance terms and the and the bias term um, that involve this R k star, um, you know the variance component that's due to that uh, high variance subspace. Yeah. Ah, so uh, yeah, if there is no um, k for which uh, this effective rank is bigger than n, then the lower bound is bigger than a constant. So, so no, it's not always it's not always defined, but you know we can't we can't hope to estimate things in that in that case. So I'm yeah I I guess that's not explicit on that. Uh, the, 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 I mean, I, I understand the definition, but what, 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 yeah, so, so, um, uh, you know, the, the K star here is, is a sort of effective, effective dimension of the problem. Um, the way it's, the way it's defined is by, by progressively dropping these, these, uh, highest variance directions, uh, uh, subspaces, uh, uh, dimensions, and, and then in the remaining orthogonal subspace, evaluating how close to isotropic things are in some sense, you know, isotropic and high dimensional. So, so you know, that's what we're really looking for is, is after we drop these heaviest, heaviest uh, directions, then we end up with something that's, that's high dimensional compared to the sample size, uh, um, you know, and, and not too asymmetric. In the in the variance we see in that in that subspace, right? Does it exist the dimensions are those which will be like that? It will be decomposed into spikes. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess I used spiky in a way that's ambiguous when you talk about covariance models, didn't I? Um, right. So the the. Um, um, yeah, maybe forget that that adjective. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the heaviest directions, yes, these are the ones where you know the, all the signal that matters are, are in these k star heaviest directions, and the remaining directions. You know, a, actually, I was just about to explain the remaining directions really don't play a part in in prediction uh, in in this setting. Um, uh, okay. So so you know, if we look at what happens, the variance term that arises from um, uh, from that k star dimensional subspace, um, uh, you know, looks like a classical sigma squared k, k over n uh, kind of contribution, right? So it's as if we're estimating things just in that subspace. Um, and, and if we look at the bias that arises from the orthogonal subspace, it's as if we're estimating zero down there in that low, low variance subspace. Is the bias Ah uh, yes, these these k's should be k star down here. Thank you. That's right. Uh, if k star is larger than than n, the upper bound. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I'm I guess I'm being a little sloppy here. That's right. I mean, in in the case where k star is larger than n, we have a lower bound that's a constant. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. Than by the y's or the theta star. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can see that the scale of the signal certainly plays a role uh, in, in 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 the bias term. But yeah. Any other questions? All right. So. Um, so, you know, this is consistent with the intuition that we had that there's this, uh, and I've nicely dropped the uh, spiky adjective here, um, that, that there's this uh, heavy subspace where all the prediction is, is going on, and then there's this orthogonal subspace where um, uh, th that's being used to fit the noise, but it plays no role in prediction. It doesn't, doesn't help or hurt. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and doesn't hurt in particular, we need this N over capital R K star uh, to be small. Okay, um, so, you know, why are the eigenvalues playing this role? So the eigenvalues are sort of doing two things here. Um, uh, they determine where the noise in the Ys uh, appears in the theta hats, and they also determine um, how the errors in, in theta hat uh, you know, affects predictive accuracy, right? That's the, the, the weight that we assign to, to errors in different directions. Um, and, and, you know, what the theorem tells us is that we've got to take the energy in that noise. Um, it's, it's got to appear in theta hat because we're getting, uh, we're getting an interpolating, interpolating solution, but we're taking that energy and distributing it across lots of unimportant directions in theta hat. Right, in the in the theta space, so you know we need a high dimensional um, space. We need we need um, uh, you know a, a, a lot of directions compared to the sample size, um, uh, and and those those directions you know ideally they should be uh, unimportant directions, right? In order to get a small value of this uh, excess risk, those. Um, uh, that, that subspace, we need to have small eigenvalues, and, and it's better if they're um, uh, roughly equal. Things are roughly isotropic there. Okay, um, so let me say a little bit about the, the proof and, and uh, what's going on, and I'll, I'll kind of try and inject a little intuition in, in a couple of places here. Um, so, uh, you know, I've talked about bias invariance. There's, there's a kind of signal piece of the Ys, there's this X transpose theta star, and there's a noise piece, which is everything else, right? Y minus um, X transpose theta star. Um, and the excess expected loss gets split into those two components. Um, we can think of uh, that um, R of theta hat having a component that's due to, you know, our distorted view of theta star that, that arises because we're not um, uh, we, we don't see the actual covariance. Uh, we see just, just our sample. Um, and, and of course, there's the noise piece. The, the first part is, is, you know, actually not such a big deal. Um, even in high dimensions, the second part is much more interesting, right? And that's, um, you know, what I'll, what I'll focus on in telling you about the proof. Of course, we're asking, you know, how can we put, put all this label, label noise in the theta hats without, without hurting predictive accuracy? OK, so let's look at this decomposition. Let's think of splitting the Y into the signal piece and the noise piece, so defining the vector epsilon in this way. And then, um, and of course, our estimator is linear here, right? Um, uh, so, you know, we can write the, the Y as those two pieces, and theta hat has the corresponding two pieces, right? The piece due to theta star and the piece due to the, the, the noise vector epsilon. And, you know, substitute that into the excess risk. Um, and, and we get two pieces. You know, the, the um, piece of theta hat due to the x theta star piece gives us a quadratic form in theta star. All right, and, and you know, I've, I've written things in terms of this sample covariance matrix, sigma hat, 
which is um, you know, 1 over n times the x transpose x's that appear up there. Uh, and I've thrown in an extra sigma hat in here because it's in an orthogonal. It's ortho uh, we've got this projection i minus uh, sigma hat pseudo inverse sigma hat. So that sigma hat in the middle plays no role, but it shows you that you know, we're, really uh, we're, we're really estimating uh, sigma there, and as our estimate gets better, um, let's say in spectral norm, then you know, that first piece goes away. Right? And the second piece is the more interesting one. It's the, it's the variance piece that's due to this, this noise epsilon. Um, you know, there's a, this approximately equal thing is, is holds with high probability. We're just saying that the quadratic form we get from that epsilon is um, well approximated by this expectation. Okay. Um, so that's the crucial quantity, the sigma squared trace of x transpose x pseudo inverse times the, the covariance matrix. Um, and you know, at this point, it's helpful, I think, to think about two examples. And, and you know, I'm going to use notation that's suggestive of this k star dimensional piece and the, and the high dimensional piece. So let's think about a low dimensional example first. Um, you know, a classical parametric setting. X is, is uh, standard Gaussian, it's k dimensional, k is much smaller than n. Okay, so here, you know, our x transpose x is going to be a good estimate of the covariance or scaled, scaled covariance. Okay, so, you know, the first piece kind of goes away. The second piece we can write as, you know, being something very close to sigma squared times the trace of, you know, our estimate of the covariance here. Um, uh, gives us a, a k by k matrix uh, that's, that's uh, close to the identity and there's a 1 over n in there, right? So the trace of that thing uh, is k, we get a k over n times sigma squared in this case, right? You know, totally classical. Okay, that's the low dimensional case and the high dimensional case is, is sort of a dual of that. So suppose our x comes from uh, uh, standard Gaussian of dimension p, now much bigger than n, right? So in this case, um, when we take this uh, sigma hat transpose, uh, sigma hat pseudo inverse sigma hat, um, you know, that's projecting onto the span of the data, all right? So uh, in, in this high dimension RP. So we're projecting onto an n-dimensional subspace. For, for Gaussians, this is, uh, you know, we have this spherical symmetry, so it's a random n-dimensional subspace. Um, and that's going to be, you know, very close to orthogonal to theta star. Okay, so when we look at the, the bias and variance terms that arise here, we get, you know, this first one is projecting onto a subspace where theta star is just, you know, going to be all, almost orthogonal. We get, um, uh, you know, we see almost none of that theta star, right? And so that, that bias term is as if we'd predicted zero, right? As if our theta hat was zero. Uh, you know, very close to that, 1 minus n over p. Uh, and the, the variance term, you know, this is just the dual of the previous situation. So, um, you know, that x, x transpose, um, so, so we had an x transpose x pseudo inverse. All the eigenvalues are the same as x, x transpose, which is our, you know, n dimensional uh, rank n uh, matrix. Uh, it's very close to an identity scaled by. So this is just like the sample covariance of a um, uh, n-dimensional um, uh, Gaussian where we've got a sample of size p. Right. So the trace here is is n, and and it's like it's like an identity matrix scaled by one over one over p. Uh, right. So x x transpose is like p times an identity. Okay, so we get, you know, n over p times sigma squared in that second term. Okay, um, uh, so, you know, these, these two situations are kind of, you know, analogous to what's going on here in the, the, um, the k star dimensional subspace and the, and the high dimensional subspace. And if we think of a special case um, where, you know, the, the um, k biggest eigenvalues are all 1 and the remaining eigenvalues are all something small where k is much smaller than n, n's much smaller than p, and epsilon times p is smaller than n, right? So the energy in that, in that um, low variance subspace is small. Then, you know, k star is, is k, and these effective ranks are both, you know, whatever dimension is left, p minus k. Uh, and, um, you know, that's very much like this low dimensional, high dimensional split, right? We have the k dimensional 
piece um, and, and the p minus k dimensional uh, tail is like our high dimensional. Okay, so that's a bit of the, bit of the intuition here. Just going back to you know, the argument, um, uh, some, uh, some uh, sketch of these proof ideas. So, so you know, we, we've got this excess risk as a quadratic form. We can split it into these, the sum over the, the lambda i's, the, the sum over these different directions. Um, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to do this split into the, you know, k heaviest directions, the remaining light directions. Um, crucial point here is, is that condition that defines k star right, is, is saying, uh, is used because when the effective rank, when that notion of effective rank is bigger than n, then we get concentration of the eigenvalues of, of the non-zero eigenvalues of x transpose x, right? So, so x transpose x is this um, p by p, you know, possibly infinite dimensional thing that, that has rank n. Um, uh, and so we're looking at the, the kind of um, uh, k plus one to nth um, uh, eigenvalues of that thing. Um, so it turns out they're all concentrated around, un under this condition, they're concentrated around the sum of those eigenvalues. Um, so, you know, just, just to give you some intuition there for the Gaussian case, um, uh, we can, you know, rewrite things as standard normal. So this x times vi is the, is the eigenvector, one of the eigenvector directions for our covariance matrix sigma. If, and, and we're rescaling things by uh, one over the square root of the eigenvalue in that direction, then in, in the Gaussian case, you know, this thing has unit covariance. These are standard normals, right? Um, and so, you know, writing x, x transpose as x times the sum of the vi, vi transpose times x transpose, you know, we get this expression. So we've got a bunch of uh, independent zi, zero transposes, right? Yeah. Standard normals. Um, so now, if we think about you know the the sort of trailing sum here, when we eliminate those k heaviest directions, um, then we get concentration of the eigenvalues of of this matrix A k. The biggest this notation means the the biggest eigenvalue is going to be bounded by the sum of those eigenvalues plus n times the the, the largest of them, uh, and lower bounded by you know, I guess this is up to constants, lower bounded by that sum minus n times the largest of them. And of course, this rank con effective rank condition is saying, you know, the n times the largest one goes away, right? That's exactly what it's, what it's telling us. So we get concentration within, within a constant factor. This thing has a, has a constant condition number, this matrix AK. Right, so under that condition, if we have a K for which this condition satisfied, then all those eigenvalues are, Within a constant factor of this sum, sum of the uh, of the um, the the, the uh, empirical matrix, this AK has eigenvalues that are close to the sum of the population um, eigenvalues lambda K plus one through, uh, and so on. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess this is just the thinking of the Gaussian case um, where things are nice and easy. Um, you know, as an alternative, you can use a small ball. Assumption to get a lower bound and sub-Gaussian um, uh, property to get an upper bound uh, and, uh, uh, you know, get, get the result more generally. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of crucial concentration that, that we need. And that means that this, um, the non-zero uh, eigenvalues of x transpose x uh, are nicely bounded away from zero. So if we look at x, x transpose, right, this gram matrix, matri matrix of inner products, um, its smallest eigenvalue is bigger than this number uh, rho, which is the sum of the, the small eigenvalues, lambda one through, uh, lambda k plus one, um, and so on. Okay, so this is kind of analogous to ridge regression, right? Our estimator here is taking the pseudo inverse of x transpose x times x transpose y, and we know that all of those non-zero eigenvalues in that pseudo inverse are bounded away from zero. So it's as if we put a row i in there, at least for the small eigenvalues, it's as if we, we put a, uh, 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 I don't know what it is, it's, it, right? It's a lot like ridge regression, which adds in row, row to every eigenvalue uh, and makes sure we don't, we don't get um, anything too close, uh, closer than that to zero. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand which part of the idea here that you need to control the 
need a nipper doll on this finger or the ring. Because if you use a swivel, you just need to. Yeah. Yeah. The upper bound the upper bound relies on like a you know, we, we can use a sub Gaussian property. Where is the food that you have here Uh so so we wanna have we wanna have a condition number that's um uh, that's like a constant, right? So we, we actually want uh, all these eigenvalues to be to be close to this uh, sum of lambda i. Yeah, so so I haven't um, I haven't pointed out where the where the upper bound uh, applies, have I? Um, uh, right. So um, you know, and I'm kind of presenting a Gaussian example is a little different from the way the proof really really works. So uh, actually, there's a sort of uh, deterministic argument that says if the condition number of this a k is like a constant, then you know everything else everything else follows uh, follows from that. But it's true. I'm not I'm not really revealing where the where the upper bound is applied. Yeah. Okay. Um, Uh, right, so so we have um, so so okay. So let's think about and and again, I'm just going to go through, through some intuition here. Um, let's think about this this term that's attributable to the noise vector epsilon, um, and and think about you know where the energy from that epsilon appears in the theta hat. Uh, if we're looking in a direction v i, uh, so one of these eigenvector directions for our covariance matrix, um, then you know the x transpose uh, <clears throat> x transpose epsilon is going to see noise energy that's proportional to uh, lambda i, the eigenvalue in that direction, uh, scaled by n. Right? We have a uh, sample of size n. You know, n independent contributions there. Um, the pseudo inverse means we scale that by one over rho, uh, and so the energy gets scaled by one over rho squared, or something no more than than that. <clears throat> That's the smallest um, non-zero eigenvalue. And uh, the impact on the prediction error in that direction is scaled by a lambda i. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, so you know, multiplying those out, we get a, a, an upper bound on the prediction error that looks like n times lambda i squared times uh, 1 over rho squared. Summing those up over directions, I guess actually in the heavier directions, we can do a little better. And, and you know this classical argument gives us a one over n in those directions. Summing those up over all the directions, the first k gives us k over n, and the remainder give us n times the sum of these different pieces, which is exactly this n over capital R k. <clears throat> okay, and um, uh, so this is true for any k that satisfies that condition that implies the concentration. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, and uh, it turns out that minimizing that bound over any k satisfying the condition is, um, you know, you you get the minimum at uh, at k star. Um, okay, and the lower bound, you know, the various terms appear in in um, uh, essentially the same way. Uh, you know, in particular for the variance, we get this trace term again, and the in the situation where the eigenvalues are concentrated. We get um, uh, the, the same low bound within a constant factor. Um, in the condition when they're not concentrated, we get a low bound that's a constant. Okay, so um, let me say a little bit about uh, when we might hope to see um, uh, this, this uh, tight bound on excess risk going to zero as the sample size grows. Right, so kind of you know looking for a consistency result here. Um, uh, the bias term is kind of problematic. You know, we're talking about a sequence now of of problems. What's what's the theta star going to look like, um, uh, and 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 what's the interaction between that and and sigma? I'm going to work with an upper bound on the bias term, um, uh, and you know that that factors out this let's say finite norm theta star. Um, uh, and, and say, you know, if we have this upper bound going to zero, 
right, then, then what we want is, is all three of those terms going to zero as the sample size grows. So let's call this asymptotically benign if we have a sequence of covariance matrices for which this happens. Um, you know, in the infinite dimensional case, that could be a single matrix and we're just looking at uh, a single covariance operator and we're just looking at what happens in the limit as n gets large. Yeah. B is a universal constant, yeah. No, it's, I mean, this is part of the theorem is there exists a constant and, you know, the proof gives us an explicit value for that. Uh, same for the, for the C, but, you know, here we're wanting our limit to go to zero. Right, right. I mean, B is sort of part of the analysis, right? It defines this effective dimension. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, B is, B is an absolute constant. That's a terrible bound, right? That just gives you something that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, so, so, you know, we, we only need RK to be just bigger than a constant times N, but we better hope for capital RK to be much bigger than that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, this is what we're looking for. As n gets large, we want this quantity to go to zero. So you can show, if you think about just uh, uh, polynomial decay of the eigenvalues, um, we need to be right at the, at the limit of, of the sum converging, right? So actually we need uh, 1 over i times some uh, 1 over log, log i. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that's... That's the only case where we have this, this uh, limit being zero uh, for, for uh, sort of any of these uh, polynomial decays, you know, and any faster decay, of course, is, um, is even worse. So, so we need to have the sum of the eigenvalues almost diverging, um, which seems like, you know, quite a specific uh, condition on a covariance matrix to have a phenomenon like this appearing. Um, but it turns out if you, if you truncate at finite dimension, then you know, there are much more generic situations where you have this, this uh, property arising. So, for instance, a fast decaying thing like an exponential plus some isotropic component, right, constant isotropic component, um, and you truncate at some dimension Pn, right? So as long as Pn is big compared to n, and the, the energy in that isotropic component, epsilon n times Pn, is small compared to n, then we're good. Can't be too small, right? We can't have epsilon n zero but um, that's a mild condition. Uh, and you can be quantitative about it in terms of what this uh, excess risk looks like for this case. Um, you can also, yeah, so as I say, this is a more generic uh, phenomenon. You can also have slowly decaying eigenvalues that you truncate at some point, right? And suitably slowly decaying eigenvalues, um, you know, uh, with, with some uh, appropriate rate and truncated at some appropriate point and, and, and everything's good. Okay, so, uh, you know, in, in finite dimensions, finite but large dimensions, it, it seems like a much more generic sort of phenomenon. Okay, let me briefly say something about um, ridge regression. So, um, uh, you know, this is where we add in a, um, a quadratic penalty. Lambda here might be, might be zero. I guess I put, a, I put an inverse there rather than a pseudo-inverse, so I didn't really... Um, account for lambda being zero. Oh no, I did. I wrote it as in this n by n way. Great. Um, uh, so, so you know, this is the estimator we're considering in the ridge regression case. It's um, you know thinking about uh, these this range of overfitting situations from from the interpolating one, you know, from through very small values of of regularization, you know, all the way up to to sort of let's say sensibly regularized. Um, uh, ridge regression. Uh, and you can get, uh, you know, similarly tight bounds on, on bias and variance, and, and what changes is that the sum of the eigenvalues in the tail, get, get, that sum gets augmented by this regularization parameter. You know, every, every, you can do a cut and paste, and that's, that's the new theorem, right? It's really that, that piece that gets um, uh, boosted by the lambda. Um, you know, one curious thing is that if you're considering the estimate that's written in this way, um, in some cases it turns out the, the best value of lambda to choose is going to be a negative one, right? Because if you have this, um, a nice big value of capital RK, 
uh, K-star, um, then you know, actually you're introducing significant bias with the, the badly estimated covariance matrix and, and a negative value of lambda can reduce that bias without significantly increasing the variance uh, in, the, in those sort of situations. So, um, you know, kind of a curiosity. Okay, and there's, there's the theorem. Um, you know, as I say, you're just, you're just changing the, uh, anywhere the sum of eigenvalues appears, you're, you're augmenting it with the, the um, ridge regression coefficient lambda. Okay, so um, let me sum up. So, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, kind of far from these, these classical setups of, of having a trade-off between the fit to the training data and the complexity of our prediction rule. What we need here is having this uh, long flat tail of the, the covariance eigenvalues. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, a place for the noise to be hidden. Um, so we want lots of roughly equally unimportant parameter directions in some sense. Um, it's curious that, that uh, finite dimensional data seems to be important. Um, we require a really specific eigenvalue decay in the infinite dimensional case, but it seems much more generic if you've got a slow decay or, or no decay that's truncated. Um, and, you know, we can extend things to ridge regression. Thanks. So let me say just a little bit about um, uh, some next steps. So there has been a um, question about um, other norms. So if you're willing to assume Gaussian data, then um, you know, it turns out there's a, a different argument uh, that um, Kohler, Joe, Sutherland, and Srebro um, uh, developed that, that uses a, um, a Gaussian comparison inequality, so, so min, Gaussian min-max inequality. Um, and there you can, you, you can then apply that with um, you know, convex, uh, uh, kind of quantities that are optimized <clears throat> in place of the, the uh, Euclidean norm or squared Euclidean norm. Um, but that, that does seem to be, you know, really restricted to, to the Gaussian case. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about, you know, the deep neural nets, the kind of motivation for, for uh, trying to understand this phenomenon um, uh, initially, um, there has been, uh, you know, a, a, a few really interesting pieces of work. Um, they all have a, a kind of linear flavor. So, um, uh, so there's this work um, that uh, Teng Yuen and uh, Sasha Racklin and uh, Xiu Zhai did on uh, kernel methods, where the kernel is a nonlinear function of an inner product. And, and one example of that is, is this neural tangent kernel. So it's a kind of um, linear view, local linear view of what, what uh, deep networks are computing. So, you know, it, it turns out if you um, consider a, a sufficiently wide network that has um, uh, a suitable initialization, then, then you can get, um, you can take a kind of first order Taylor series approximation uh, of, of uh, the function computed by that network at uh, a Taylor series approximation around the initialize the random initialization, uh, and, and view that um, linear class. Uh, you can show that you know under suitable suitable conditions that linear class is a good approximation to what uh, the the um, uh, neural net is computing. Um, so, for instance, in a in the two layer case, you know you can think about the function computed by um, a network with a nonlinearity sigma here um, applied to a, an inner product, uh, that that thing is close to this sort of first order approximation, which gives you, you know, a linear representation um, that you can think of as defining a kernel um, uh, on any two points. Uh, uh, so you can think of this as a, as a point in a finite dimensional reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and that the, the kernel here you know, obviously depends on the initialization. I mean, a whole lot of work in uh, analyzing what goes on in, in um, uh, neural nets from this perspective. Um, uh, and, you know, and this, this kernel, by the way, has exactly the flavor that it, of the, the work of Tenguin and collaborators that I mentioned. It's a, a nonlinear function of the, um, the inner product in the input space. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, there's work analyzing that sort of linear family, um, analyzing 
random feature models where you, you uh, randomly choose early parameters in a network and then, and then estimate the linear parameters. So again, a linear setting. Um, you know, these, both of these fall outside the assumptions that we need, the sub-Gaussian assumptions that we need um, for, for our analysis to go through. Um, uh, you know, so there's sort of a more fine-grained um, analysis that's required. Um, but, but, you know, they're, they're really uh, still essentially linear. Uh, and I think the, the very, uh, very interesting open, open direction is understanding what happens in, in non-linearly parameterized function classes, like the deep networks that, where, where this phenomenon was, was observed. Um, you know, what happens in those cases, and in particular, do we see this same sort of decomposition into uh, a simple piece, classically simple piece, and, and you know, a complex piece that's not, um, not helpful or, or hurtful in, in prediction. I think that's exciting. All right, a um, bunch of papers that I talked about, and well, one that I didn't, I guess. Um, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so, so there has been work, I guess I didn't give any pointers here, there has been work on a classification setting. Um, uh, uh, I guess the first, the first of those was uh, due to uh, Niladri Chatterjee and, and Phil Long. So looking at, you know, under, under um, a suitable model for the process generating the data, they, they look at the same sort of phenomenon in a classification setting. There's been um, also, also work calculating exact asymptotics in a classification setting with more, you know, logistic regression kinds of models. The um, Teng Yuen's considered related things in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in that sort of setting. Um, so, so yeah, there have there have been uh, extensions in in those directions. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, that's a good question because so so the results I know about are sort of uh, you know tied to the tied to the models that um, uh, that they they assume, but. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I, I I don't I don't know. I would have to I would have to check. Teng Yuen, do you do you say something about your your case? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not advocating, you know, the, the use of this sort of approach in a linear setting, um, a linear regression setting. Um, you know, actually, um, Muhammad's talk this afternoon for, you know, a different, different problem is going to point out a case where there are, you know, robustness benefits from, from interpolation. So, uh, you know, I think that's interesting. Um, uh, I think in the nonlinear setting, uh, uh, you know, what I, what I suspect is going on there is there's a computational advantage to shooting for a zero empirical risk solution. And, you know, I, uh, I, I think, you, you know, we're seeing that there's not much of a disadvantage from the statistical perspective of taking that approach, which, which you know, I think most likely confers a computational advantage. But yeah, in the in the linear setting where we where you have a convex optimization problem, you know, I, I think there's no there's no reason to uh, to use this approach in in general. Yeah. You had a question. 
Choice is not so social, I think. Or if you have some outliers, I mean, if, if your model is not quite correct. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I guess some of these, these results, the analysis that um, Andrea Montanari and collaborators uh, came up with get, doing uh, computing exact asymptotics, they were looking at you know, much milder um, assumptions there. They could get by without the, uh, with, with misspecification. Um, the, um, so for instance, in, in uh, the random features model that I mentioned at the end, where they're, they're choosing these nonlinear uh, parameters that enter nonlinearly, choosing them randomly, fixing them, and then considering the, that random linear class. Um, the asymptotics they looked at there was, you know, the width, the sample size, and the input dimension had to grow at appropriate rates. And, and you know, the, the function that they were estimating is just, just needs to be something in L2. And, you know, the, the results you get involves the, um, the sort of unmodeled component, the component that you don't have enough uh, richness to, to represent. That, that unmodeled component appears just like noise in some sense. So there are extensions, I guess, to all of these, all of these kinds, of, kinds of cases, um, uh, you know, but without the, 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 the quantitative results that we get are a little less less clear there. They have, um, uh, I guess things are incomparable. They can have rates that are, that are worse than these. Um, uh, the asymptotics are exact, so they're getting constants that are better, you know, at some point in, in the cases that we looked at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question similar to Victor. So um, in your simple linear model, in order to understand things, I mean, you could improve your estimate just by using principal component regression. So you project onto the, yeah. I mean, if you know everything or whatever, you, you know. That's right. Um, so do people do this in, in, in deep learning as well? I mean, you could have some post-processing, just smooth out the interpolated solution. Would that give better results? There? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. It's clear, it's clear in this setting that you can, you can get rid of this sort of ridge regression flavor of bias by, by you know, just projecting onto those, those K-star directions. Um, but the ideas are out in deep learning to, to have some post-processing of the interpolated solution. I mean, this would be somehow a kind of a natural thing to do. Right, right. I, I haven't seen things that, that, you know, are focused on that sort of, that sort of approach, no. Um, but it does, does seem like a, uh, a natural one. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. All right, thank you.